Let me give you a little bit of my background before I speak on this theme of missionary spirituality and particularly emphasizing what I call missional incarnational spirituality. I have always been interested in the area of spirituality. I think because I met the Lord in such a radical way, in such an experientially deep way and profound way, I couldn't help but to be interested in spirituality from the very beginning. When I first arrived at Fuller Seminary in the early 1980s, there was a sort of a Holy Spirit revival that was going on at that time. And I remember taking some courses under this uh, sort of a pastor who didn't have much of an academic degrees, but he was teaching courses on spirituality and power encounter and ministry and spiritual gifts and so forth. His name was John Wimber, the founder of Vineyard Movement. And I was heavily influenced by what I heard, what I experienced during that time. And I've always wanted to integrate spirituality with theology. And uh, as a result, I ended up writing doctoral dissertation in exactly that area of spirituality in mission. And I actually studied the biblical prophets and apostles to see how they experienced God and how they received their call and commission from God. And uh, I, I wrote a dissertation and, and afterwards I started teaching on the theme of spirituality in mission. I've been here in Korea teaching at X University usually known amongst the missiologists as Asian Center for Theological Studies and Mission. And here for 11 years, I've been teaching courses on spiritual theology. I teach also mission theology. And so as a result, I've gathered a lot of data. I've written many theses, and I finalized the book, which I think uh, will be published sometime soon. And, and I hope that uh, this background will give you a little bit of an assurance that uh, I may know what I'm talking about, and I may be a little bit ahead of most missiologists who are just recently thinking about integrating spirituality and mission. So now let me uh, get to my topic on So let me uh, begin by saying that the purpose of my presentation here and the thesis that I wrote is to examine the topic of Christian spirituality in anticipation of missional engagement in the 21st century post-pandemic era. The title for this conference was actually something that I came up and I basically had to rally others to join in and start thinking in terms of applying spirituality theme in the context of mission. And our speakers have done that exactly. Now, we are familiar with the mission of church movement. I believe it has had a great impact upon the global body of Christ. And uh, this mission of church movement has provided a new innovative paradigm in terms of concept theory and practice for mission, especially at the turn of this century. But the topic of spirituality has not been widely discussed in the mission uh, circles in general. But there are a few exceptions I've discovered. There's a, a book titled Mission, Spirituality, and Authentic Discipleship, edited by Wen Sok Ma and Kenneth Ross. And uh, this was a, a compendium of writings that dealt with especially the Pentecostal effect, that is, work of the Holy Spirit in mission in different nations and different contexts. I find this book to be very helpful. Another book titled Spirituality and Mission, Embracing the Lifelong Journey, edited by John Amarjad and others, from WEA Mission Commission. Now, this book basically is talking about spiritual formation in general and doesn't specifically touch upon the areas of missiology that I was concerned about. But this book is also good reference. Another book is titled Spirituality for the Sent, Casting New Vision for the Missionary Church, 
It's edited by Nathan Finn and Keith Whitfield. And this book, I would say, is very useful for what we are about to talk about at this forum. So you may want to check up, up on these books in the future. And I've listed here some titles of books that are recently dealing with uh, the topic of spirituality and mission. And there are more coming. There are more theses being written today. So there is an interest. But usually in missiological forums and conferences, we haven't heard too much on the theme of spirituality. Let me just mention some of these book titles. Spirituality for Mission, Historical, Theological, and Cultural Factors for a Present-Day Missionary Spirituality. Reading the Plows, Mission Spirituality for New Times. Subversive Spirituality, Transforming Mission Through the Collapse of Space and Time. Missioner Spirituality, Embodying God's Love from the Inside. Cultivating Sent Communities, Missioner Spiritual Formation. And Urban Spirituality, embodying God's mission in the neighborhood. So the aim of this thesis that I'm about to present to you is to give you an overview of the key topics and contemporary issues related to Christian spirituality, especially and particularly in the context of the missionary church movement. And in addition, I want to propose a missional incarnational model of spirituality as the premier solution for the spiritual issues and problems the churches may likely encounter in their missionary endeavors in the post-pandemic era. And this is the outline for my presentation. I will first of all uh, present the paradigm of missionary church, and then I will give a working definition of spirituality, and then I will deal with some topics that are related to mission or spirituality. And I've kind of uh, went back to all my experiences of spirituality and, and attempt to uh, integrate that with missiology. And I've came up with a number of topics here, such as supernatural worldview, spiritual experience, spiritual call commission, uh, spiritual gifts and Holy Spirit manifestations, healing and restoration, spiritual warfare, spiritual discernment, spiritual life in general. Let me begin by giving you a sort of an introduction into missionary church. If you're not familiar with this topic, with this concept, and with this movement, I think this can be a sort of a summary for you. At the very turn of this century, there emerged a significant movement among the mission-minded Christian leaders who proposed a most holistic and strategic way of influencing the world for Christ. And this was called the Missionary Church Movement. Now, in order to understand the Missionary Church Movement, I think we need to see an overview of the modern Protestant missionary movements. And I would see the Missionary Church in that long lineage of the Protestant missionary movements. Uh, we start with the coastland mission movement, and the person that we need to remember is William Carey. And you start with the coastland strategically because that's where most of the significant cities were, that's where they were connected to the rest of the world and so forth. And then through Hudson Taylor, we know that uh, the strategy was to enter inland, and that is the inland mission movement. And then, especially through the influence of Ralph Winter, we see unriched people group movement and thriving even to this day. But along with that, as we are about to enter into the 21st century, there was a movement that was launched, and that is known as the Missionary Church Movement. Some seminal missiological writings that helped to launch this movement are as follows. Francis Dubose, his book titled God Who Send in 1983, and Dr. Charles Van Engen, he was my PhD mentor, and uh, his book, God's Missionary People in 1991, was influential as well. But perhaps the one who really uh, helped to spark and inspire the missionary movement advocates was Leslie Newbigin through his book, The Gospel in a Pluralist Society in 1989, 
and the Open Secret revised version in 1995. But it was really the book titled Mission or Church, edited by Daryl Gooder in 1998, in association with the gospel and our culture network in Great Britain and North America and New Zealand, which helped to really launch this movement. So today we have all these Christian leaders, theologians, missiologists, Christian educators, denominational leaders, pastors, lay leaders, church planters, and so on. All of these leaders, many of them, have opened themselves to this concept of a missionary church. The basic premise of the missionary church movement is that the church of Jesus Christ is essentially mission-natured and mission-purposed. That God's intention is that the whole church, not just individual missionaries, be sent as a missionary force into the world. And I like this statement by Christopher Wright, the author of the book, The Mission of God. He's, he's an Old Testament scholar, but he's also a missiologist. It is not so much the case that God has a mission for his church in the world, but that God has a church for his mission in the world. Mission was not made for the church. The church was made for mission, God's mission. And I think it is very important for us to be reminded that the church does not just exist for its existence sake. Church exists for the sake of mission and the agenda of God. So missional hermeneutics basically deals with two poles. We have the theological pole and the cultural pole. And the theological side is this, that the concept of mission of church is based on the theological foundation of Missio Dei, and more specifically Missio Trinitatis. And that is the term translated as mission of God or mission of the Trinity. But at the same time, it is grounded in the cultural or social context in which the church must witness the gospel. So we're not just talking about theology of mission. We're talking about the cultural context of mission. And these two poles are, I wouldn't say as important, but they are equally necessary for us to truly do mission. I've summarized the, the concept of mission and church for you, and I have some statements here. You might be interested in just uh, placing them in your heart and in your mind. First, a mission and church exists for the ultimate purpose of God's glory and His missional agenda in this world. The mission and church finds its origin and source for mission in the missionary nature and agenda of the triune God. The missionary church is committed to the incarnational approach as embodied, proclaimed, and demonstrated by Jesus Christ. The missionary church abides by Christ's example and commission. As Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you in John 20, 21. The missionary church envisions all Christians to function as missionaries in their particular cultural context and beyond. The missionary church interacts purposefully and meaningfully with culture, exercising Christ-like wisdom and discernment of the world. The missionary church is called to be the transforming agent of the world as the salt of the earth and the light of the world. The missionary church embodies and enacts Christ-likeness so that Christ may continue his ministry through the church here on earth. Now let me talk about spirituality. And I will do my very best to define what I mean by spirituality. Spirituality, particularly from a missional perspective, is relatively a new and fresh theme. Thus, we need to explain the concept of spirituality for the sake of clarity and definition. The concept of spirituality has been difficult to define in precise terms. Even those who have been studying the history of spirituality and, and have been writing books on theology and methodology of spirituality find it very difficult. There are 
tons of definitions and perspectives regarding spirituality. In the process, the term spirituality has been explained in so many diverse ways that practically anything could be labeled as spirituality. And you've heard the statement, if everything is mission, then nothing is mission. And I'll say the same thing about spirituality. If everything is spirituality, then nothing really is spirituality. But in essence, everything is spirituality. But we also need to define spirituality so that we can understand one another when we use that term. So there is definitely a need to utilize a specific term, spirituality, in order to depict something which may be deeply meaningful, essential, and even transcendental, including God and the supernatural realms. The literal sense of the term spirituality would mean the dimension of the spirit or spiritual. And this would uh, mean that we're talking about something of inner essence or immaterial reality or supernatural realm. But here we must be cautious so as not to dichotomize the spiritual and the physical or the material. And in other words, we don't want to fall into dualism, which the Gnostics tend to do and the mystics tend to do. They view spiritual in opposition to the physical or material. In other words, spirituality is antithetical to a physicality and materiality. The concepts of spiritual should be understood. This is my opinion, but I believe that uh, this is something that so many writers on spirituality have affirmed and confirmed. That the concept of spirituality should be understood in a holistic, inclusive sense, analogous to essence or depth in terms of life principle, whether in relation to God, self, people, nature, or universe. From a Christian perspective, the concept of spiritual should imply a God-oriented and specifically Trinity-oriented, Christ-centered, and Spirit-influenced way of life. As Apostle Paul pointed out in texts like Galatians 5 and, and Romans 8 and 1 Corinthians 2, that the spiritual, pneumaticus, way should be understood in opposition not to the physical, the material, but to the fleshly, sarticus way, and which has to do with the self-oriented, self-reliant, that is human-centered, worldly-minded way of life. And so we need to place spiritual in opposition to the fleshly. And the fleshly here is not just simply talking about the body. It can be the body, it could be mind, it could be even the soul. But how we regard God and how we regard the reality of God. And that's where the opposition is. So if the spiritual way implies a God-oriented, God-dependent way of life, then it should incorporate both the natural, that is physical and material, and the supernatural dimensions as well. And uh, let me give you some distinctions regarding Christian spirituality. As most of you know, the topic of spirituality is common in all religions. Uh, every religious belief system has an emphasis on spirituality. But here I'm just talking about Christian spirituality. Christian spirituality should be grounded in the biblical truth. It should reflect the divine Trinitarian nature. It should be centered on Jesus Christ. It should be reliant on the Holy Spirit. It should be anthropologically holistic, including both body, mind, and soul. It should be relevant at both personal and corporate levels. It should be progressively transformative. That is, spirituality involves discussion on conversion, sanctification, and glorification. It should abide by Christ's model of incarnation and crucifixion and resurrection. So those adherents of missionary spirituality then should embody the Christian way as outlined above of life and ministry, which is truly the Father-centered, Christ-centered, and Spirit-dependent way of 
life and ministry, in engaging the world with the gospel truth as Christ's representative agents. Okay, now let me talk about the specific uh, themes that are related to uh, spirituality, and especially themes that are related to mission. Paul Hebert pointed out that the, the Western worldview is flawed due to its biased, excluded middle paradigm. The Western worldview, with its tendency toward either platonic dualism, that is otherworldly, or secular scientism, thisworldly, tends to neglect the middle level of supernatural beings and forces familiar to the tribalist or animalist society. So, basically what Paul Hebert was saying is that we need to cultivate a supernatural worldview. And uh, Alan Tippett, John Wimber, and Charles Kraft, among others, have pointed out the importance and necessity of power encounter in mission. Among many encounter categories such as truth, love, and allegiance, power encounter deals with the demonic realm in the context of spiritual warfare and deliverance ministry. Such clarion call for the re-establishment of supernatural worldview for practical missiology based on the biblical pneumatology, angelology, and demonology needs to be taken seriously by the church engaged in the highly secularized and technologized society of the 21st century. You might say, well, we've been secularized. We, we have technology at hand. And we, why do we have to go back to the primitive notions of the spirits and the spiritual realms? But it is exactly because we become so secularized and technologized that we need to emphasize once again the reality. The reality is not the virtual thing. The reality is there are demonic forces out there, the angelic beings out there. There's the Holy Spirit out there. There's heavenly realm up there that we need to be conscious of. Another thing is that of spiritual experience. Christian spirituality has to do with the experiential knowledge of all kinds of spiritual reality, whether divine, angelic, or demon, demonic, human, or worldly, based on the biblical theological foundations. Epistemic understanding of any form of reality would require that we be able to perceive such reality. For those of you who are not familiar with the term epistemic, it comes from the concept of, uh, or the philosophical discipline of epistemology that has to do with knowing. How do we know and how do we verify our knowledge? And basically what I'm trying to say here is that if there is reality out there and that reality is there for us as God created that reality, then we must have some kind of ability to perceive that reality. So we have this perception in the natural realm we have senses with which we can detect our environments and, and our surroundings. So if we have these natural perceptions, then certainly if there's spiritual reality, we should have spiritual perceptions as well. And so if we have natural senses of sight and hearing and touch and, and, uh, and taste and smell, then we should have natural senses which I believe we find the analogy of those senses in the physical senses. So if we are perceptual, uh, perceptually through natural means open to the world, then we must also be perceptually open through spiritual means to God's presence and agency in the world. Such understanding of experiencing God and spiritual reality in general would certainly have a significant missiological implication as we deal with the diverse spiritual phenomena in the nations, both the global Southeast and the global Northwest, as a result of globalization and migration, as well as the renewed appreciation for the biblical understanding of divine and supernatural encounters.
Another theme is that of spiritual call and commission. And this was the very theme that I focused upon when I was doing the research uh, for my PhD dissertation. The biblical model of divine call and commission of the Old Testament prophets and the New Testament apostles, as well as Jesus Christ, establishes the foundation for our own personal missional call and commission. The biblical prophets and apostles were known for their dynamic ministries and mission works, which resulted from their conviction of having received a divine call or commission. They claimed that they had personally encountered the Lord, they had received their commission from the Lord, and that they were empowered supernaturally by the Lord to carry out their work of mission. Such a sense of divine encounter and commission was what motivated them to persevere through suffering and persecution to fulfill their God-ordained task. If you remember Paul, how he tried to validate his apostolic authority, of course, he was able to do signs and wonders and great works of God. He had a teaching ministry and so forth. But he basically presented to the Corinthian church this huge, long catalog of suffering. He says, suffering is the evidence that I am truly called because nobody in his right mind would go through all this unless they have really, really encountered the Lord and received that commission from the Lord. All Christians and churches should find their mission of precedence in the divine call and commission of the biblical prophets and apostles and Jesus Christ and be freshly inspired and motivated to engage in the specific God-commissioned works of mission. Another theme is that of uh, spiritual gifts and Holy Spirit manifestations. We find a biblical basis for spiritual gifts in the ministry context of the body of Christ, the church. The spiritual gifts as listed in 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12 may be categorized as follows. This is my own categorization, but I think you would pretty much agree that we can categorize gifts. These are not just random gifts. The Apostle Paul had specific thought in mind as he was addressing these issues. We have the revelatory type of gifts, or the knowledge, or the wisdom, discerning of spirits. We have the vocal gifts, tongues, interpretation, tongues, and prophecy. Prophecy is revelatory, but prophecy has to be spoken, or at least it has to be communicated in order for it to be true prophecy. So I put prophecy in the vocal gifts category. Power gifts, like faith, healing, miraculous powers. Leadership gifts, teaching, exhortation, administration, service gifts, such as service, almsgiving, and mercy. Ephesians 4.11 talks about four, some people call it five-fold ministries. I think uh, the, clearly the Greek shows that it's four-fold. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, who is also a teacher. And this category refers to leadership ministry gifts, which is has to do with the purpose of equipping God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. All these gifts, and I believe that there are more. I don't think Paul is trying to give an exhaustive list of gifts. So all these gifts and more are endowed by the Holy Spirit to the members of the body of Christ for the sake of edification and empowerment of the church. Such gifts also have the potential to be utilized for effective evangelism and mission as expression of ministry to the body of Christ, to the world. Healing and miracle is another category of uh, uh, spiritual topics that are relevant to mission. If there is the reality of sin, then there is the reality of suffering, whether it be physical, emotional, spiritual, relational, racial, ethnic, gender, related, socioeconomic, and environmental. This calls for redemption and healing 
and restoration in Christ by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The ministry of physical healing reveals divine mercy and miraculous power. As Jesus and his apostles demonstrated, healing the sick, cleansing the lepers, exercising the demons, raising the dead, doing nature miracles, these are the kingdom manifestations available to the present-day church. The missionary implication of the ministries of healing, deliverance, and restoration is that the gospel is not simply proclaimed and cognitively acknowledged, but it is also demonstrated and dynamically experienced. As a result, the world would witness the transformative power of Christ in the people's lives as well as in the societal structures and realms. Spiritual warfare is another theme that's related to missionary spirituality. Spiritual warfare is a reality in this world, whether at the ground level or the occult level or strategic level, as, as uh, Peter Wagner has uh, emphasized. The demonic strategy against us may involve direct assault, spiritual oppression, accusation by the enemy, temptation, and deception. But our conviction regarding our position of spiritual authority and the exercise of such authority utilizing the arsenal of spiritual weapons, such as the name of Jesus and the blood of Jesus, the word of God, the spirit of God, praise and worship, prayer and fasting, the unity of the body of Christ, and the simple acts of obedience, we are able to stand against our spiritual enemies. Acknowledging such reality of satanic or demonic existence and spiritual warfare and convicted of our victory in Christ, we are to participate in the kingdom authority over the realms of evil and darkness in various sectors of mission field. As a result, the kingdom of this world, both the secular and religious, and the spiritual principalities and powers will be subjected to the kingdom of God. In kingdom, Basileia, in kingdom terms, then the matter of missional work is the matter of spiritual authority, exousia, and power, dunamis. Spiritual discernment is another very important theme. In these days of great chaos and confusion regarding what is true versus false, what is real versus virtual, the most crucial of all spiritual gifts and capabilities is discerning with spiritual wisdom and insight as the Holy Spirit will guide us in accordance with the Word of God. We're not only to discern the trends of the time, but also to see into the spiritual realms, whether demonic, divine, or human. We are to discern the source of action, thought, motive, attitude, and even spiritual atmosphere. Such discernment is the result of cultivating a genuine sense of familiarity with what is truly God's nature and His ways as prescribed in the Bible. Such training and exercise of spiritual discernment will be crucial and necessary in the exercise of leadership in both church ministry and world mission, especially in the globally integrated and technologically complex society of the 21st century. Spiritual leadership is another theme. A critical issue in Christian leadership in general and missional leadership in specific is that of spiritual authority in the context of ministry to the people. In exercising spiritual authority, there is always the possibility of abuse as instigated by the delegated leaders. Thus, in Christian leadership, it is not simply a matter of exercising spiritual authority. It has to do with responsible exercise of spiritual authority so as to truly take into consideration the well-being of the followers. As spiritual leaders, we need to remember that spiritual authority finds its ultimate source in God and Christ. It is the authority of Christ which has been delegated to us, and it is the presence of Christ by the Holy Spirit abiding with us which legitimates our authority. Such understanding of the principles of spiritual authority is crucial in the context of missional community, church planting, and discipleship training. Spiritual authority requires that both the leaders and followers be accountable and submissive to the final authority of Jesus Christ. And I have one more theme here, and that is spiritual life in general. As mission-minded Christians, we must be grounded in our relationship with the triune God, our allegiance to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, our incorporation into the body of Christ, that is the church, our service in the kingdom of God, 
and our witness to the unbelieving world. In order for us to function most dynamically and efficiently as Christ agents in this world, we must be solidly grounded in our sense of identity in Christ, character and integrity, and Christ-like mindset while integrating all aspects of life, whether it be personal, social, financial, vocational, all of these aspects in Christ. Such is the way of Christian spirituality that is truly Christ-focused, world-based, spirit-led, and Christ-like. Establishing such a foundational basis in our everyday life and ministry is crucial since it provides the opportunity for the world to see Christ and His likeness in and through us, the church. Now, may I ask uh, how many minutes I have left? Yes, sir, five minutes. I, I... Okay, this is what I'm going to do. Next uh, section has to do with uh, the implications for the contemporary context of mission. But this section I am going to pretty much skip over, except to just share with you that uh, the concept of secularism in this society, that this society is now post-Christian. This is very, very important. And the most important figure here, I personally think, is, is the social philosopher named Charles Taylor. In his uh, writings, he has really focused on this whole idea of secularism. Uh, his book is titled The, the Secular Age. Uh, if you get a chance, please read that. It's a nearly 900-page book. Another aspect of this, uh, this century is that of religious pluralism. That's been around for quite some time. But we need to understand that we are living in a society along with other religious affiliates. Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, Confucianism, Judaism, Islam, as well as the, the more of the underground primitive uh, cultures with all kinds of shamanic phenomenon. And uh, more of the sophisticated version of that would be the New Age movement. And in all of these interactions, we must uh, have a very clear understanding of our own spirituality, but at the same time, we need to have the openness to relate to others and appreciate their spiritualities. Here I've listed for you some characteristics of uh, different religions. Hinduism would be emphasizing tolerance and integration. Buddhism, emphasizing negation and objectivity. Taoism, focusing on nature and environment. Confucianism, uh, focusing on humanity and society. And Judaism, the theme of covenant faithfulness and Islam, submission and obedience. And globalization, we are very familiar with this uh, this concept and this notion. But basically, in one word, everything is networked. Everything is related. So there's not a single thing or factor in this world that is not related. The internet really helped to connect everything from everywhere to everywhere. It's all being interrelated. Technologism is another theme that we need to get used to. Today, we're talking about the technology and the advancements of technology that has to do with cyberspace, virtual reality, metaverse, AIs and the robotics, and, and people using terms like post-humanism, transhumanism. I think the real danger is, is, as Charles Taylor says, that there's this desouling or defleshing tendencies he actually used the term excarnation, and I think that's the greatest danger. Another aspect of this, this 21st century is that there are indigenous art and cultural movement, which I am particularly very much interested in, because my own nation, Korea, has been advancing this movement called Hallyu, or the Korean wave, as all of you are familiar with. And this has created a sort of bridge for the missionaries to reach out to the nations. 
because they are very much interested in Korean culture and Korean art forms. And so this can be a, a very effective way of sharing the gospel with others. And there's the theme of work and vocation, which Dr. Agamkar will be addressing later on. But basically, I, I just want to say that when we are working, and when we work like the way Jesus worked, uh, we are participating in actually the work of God, Opus Dei, because He is working in and through us, even today, as He did through His Son, Jesus Christ, 2,000 years ago. And then finally, global crisis. As you know, COVID-19 pandemic is one of those crises, but we got so many other types of crises. Uh, world hunger, natural disasters, global warming, global terrorism, nuclear war. And uh, this amounts to human sufferings and human state of despair and hopelessness. And which is the perfect opportunity for us Christians to enter in and give them the message of hope. Now, I, I do need to present this because this is the this conclusion part. So if you can allow me five more minutes, I would appreciate this. Uh, without hearing this part, uh, everything else is just simply introduction. So what I really want to say in conclusion is that we really need to come to terms with this concept called missional incarnational spirituality. And let me talk about this briefly and end my talk here. The incarnational model in missiology is generally associated with concept of contextualization or inculturation. However, it should primarily be understood in terms of embodiment, which is the essential understanding of incarnation. This is a critique that I have for many missiologists who just simply equate incarnation to contextualization. And it's not. you got to go through the body. Body is the important thing. And the body is, is moving, is alive, is enacting. Uh, and so we have to talk about that. Let's not just close the body with culture and just talk about culture. And if we talk about the culture of the body, then that's where we need to start. But this is very, very important. To be incarnational in life and mission in the likeness of Christ means that we must be grounded in the reality of human nature as bodily being. The term is soma. That's the Greek term for body. And that is the living body. That is in soul body. Not just body separated from the soul, but integrated body. Moreover, this bodily human existence is animated. So I used another Greek term, kinesthesis. And, uh, and that, or kinesthesia, and that is human body is animated. So we are made to move and enact so that we operate with this sense of agency. That is with a sense of purpose, with a, a sense of intent. That's where mission comes in. As we are agents of Christ, intentionally submitting to Christ's will and obeying Christ's bidding. So the incarnation model may be expressed in terms of embodied agency. The human being, as Christ exemplified through his incarnation and meant for us to be, is a living, animated, bodily agent of God who dynamically engages in actions toward God's purposes in Christ. The Christian spirituality is essentially an incarnational, embodied agency, way of being and operating as truly human in the likeness of the incarnate Christ. In Acts 17, 28, this Paul is borrowing this statement by this, this Greek Cretan philosopher, Epimenides. And he says, for in him, and, and Paul is referring to Christ, not Zeus, as the philosopher had said. But he's saying, for in Christ, we live and move and have our being. I love this statement. The significance of this concept of incarnation in Christian life may be accentuated, particularly in contrast to the notion of excarnation. The term excarnation was first used by the social philosopher Charles Taylor in his book, A Secular Age, in 2007, to critique the tendency in the Western culture of steady disembodying of spiritual life so that it is less and less carried in deeply meaningful bodily forms and lies more and more in the head. 
According to Taylor, this phenomenon is an aberration contrary to the essence of Christianity, which is based on Christ's incarnation. He says Christianity as the faith of the incarnate is denying something essential to itself as long as it remains wedded to forms which excarnate. So if rationalism and secularism of 18th and 19th centuries due to exclusive humanism, these are the words of Charles Taylor, if rationalism and secularism have contributed to the problem of excarnation, then the highly technological culture of the late 20th and early 21st centuries would exacerbate the problem even more. In the present era of the fourth industrial revolution, our lives are so immersed in and entangled within the digital technological realms of cyberspace, virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and so on. The danger within such realms, especially as implied by the so-called transhumanism and posthumanism, is the real possibility of a horrendous excarnation of humanity. However, in contrast to this trend toward excarnation, Christianity is based on the reality of Christ's incarnation. And the word became flesh, John 1.14. Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, 1 John 4.2. To be incarnational in the likeness of Christ then means that we must be grounded in the reality of human nature as living and dynamic in soul body created for God's purposes in Christ. Specifically, we are called to be Christ's bodily agents to accomplish Christ-mandated agendas in this world. The best integrated model of missionary church then, I believe, is found in the very model of Jesus' incarnation, the missional incarnational spirituality. And that is the end of my talk. And now I would like to open the floor for any questions that uh, you might want to ask me, and I will try to address them to the best of my ability. Thank you, Dr. Daniel Kim. Uh, it was such an interesting subject you shared with us today. I believe that everyone in this room had a fresh new insight in spirituality in terms of uh, missional and incarnational spirituality. I have some questions to you, uh, Dr. Daniel Gim. I hope everyone will enjoy this interaction with our speaker as we miss face-to-face -face and dynamic interaction as this is, an, this is an online forum. There were some very interesting questions, but because of time limit, I'm going to ask just one question for you. Uh, is question ready? Yes. Uh, question number three. Your message regarding the importance of the human body and movement in Christian life and mission is very enlightening. But what about those whose bodies and movement are weak and frail, sick and handicapped? How can they implement your embodied agency model? This is a very good question, and this is exactly the question that I had in mind uh, as I was coming to a sort of conclusion that the body is important, movement is important, and intentionally enacting as, as an agent of Christ is important. And we need to train people to do exactly that. But I'm also aware of people who may not be able to bodily function like that. Maybe through injury, through aging, through some kind of accident or a genetic defect. People may not be capable of fulfilling to the max. But this is what I would say to them. And by the way, I, I have finished writing a book on this theme. But the next book that I want to write is book which will apply this principle to those who are handicapped, those who are elderly, those who are frail, those who are weak, those who are immobilized. But I believe that this is relevant to everybody because Jesus expects us, expects of us in a relative sense. If your body is not able to function fully, if you're not an athlete, if you're not a healthy person, then God wants you to utilize your body to the max in that context. He's not expecting someone who is handicapped to be able to run their race like the way a healthy person can. But they can run the race, their own race. So stay on their 
own name and run the race. And I believe that they will be highly rewarded by Christ. And so this is something that I have to really think about in the future. How can the people who are weak and frail and sick and handicapped be able to apply this principle? I think this is very much relevant to them. One thing that I am determined not to do is emphasize some kind of elitistic uh, athleticism or elitistic uh, physicality uh, or body-oriented type of spirituality because we have too much obsession out there in the world. Everyone's looking into their bodies. They're they are into you know, bodily features and bodily physique. That's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about physical narcissism. We're talking about using our body as living sacrifices to worship God and to serve God. And our body is a precious gift from God. And oftentimes when we see the church history, we see that we have demeaned the body. We have uh, neglected the body. Or we have basically detached ourselves from the body. And when we do that, we detach ourselves from the world because body was made for the earth, for the earthly existence and to worldly interaction. And so I think the body is important whether it is healthy or sickly, even the suffering body. And that's another thing that I really want to emphasize in the future, suffering body. And with that suffering body, we serve the Lord to the max to the very end. My own sister passed away just was it last year and uh, she had cancer and her body basically demaciated. She, she was just, her body was just breaking down right before our sight and we saw that happening rapidly, uh, the ravaging attacks of those cancer cells and the uh, and my sister, too, her dying day, she held on to God and with everything that she could muster, the, what she could move, what she could adapt, what she could think and what she can feel, she truly loved God and left an amazing testimony unto others. And so that has been an in inspiration for me as I even talk about the importance of the body and the movement and agency in Christ. Thank you so much.